the tools were, were available um, or, or being used by Native Americans uh, for woodworking. And uh, certainly by, uh, by uh, 9,000, 8,000 years ago, they had adzes as well as celts. And, uh, and a little bit later, they came up with grooved axes around 8,000 years ago. Uh, these are the kind of tools that would be necessary for making dugout canoes. And the dugout canoes uh, enabled Native Americans to take full advantage of the changes in sea level. Uh, if a place was separated by the ocean as the sea levels rose, they could get out to it in canoes. They were also able to travel up and down rivers uh, so they could reach a wide variety of places uh, that, that on foot would take them quite a bit longer. Okay, uh, I am going to be speaking about Spectacle Island. Uh, it's a project that we, it's an excavation that we had 24 years ago. And if you're interested uh, following tonight's lecture, uh, there's more information about the Spectacle Island site uh, on the Massachusetts Historical Commission website. Some of the illustrations that I'm using tonight are from the website. Others are, are, are uh, scanned slides that we had back from the project and uh, other, other uh, illustrations have come from uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the, uh, um, uh, their archeologist, Ellen Birkeland. Uh, here we have a slide of, uh, uh, it's a Google Earth slide of Boston Harbor. And one of the things that you'll notice is Spectacle Island is uh, within this uh, broader harbor of, of islands. Um, over here, Boston um, has uh, fairly narrow waterways around it, uh, but historically that was not the case. Uh, there's been a lot of landfill that's been added to South Boston, to Back Bay, uh, all around the exterior of Boston, uh, a lot of landfill around East Boston. Uh, it was a much more open area historically. In fact, when we look at it, uh, what we see is this is uh, uh, this darker line here is the original Boston of the colonial era. Um, it uh, uh, was almost an island in itself. There's a narrow, a narrow neck of land that extends to the south. Uh, this is uh, Charles, Charlestown, East Boston. Um, but all of this was, was filled. Uh, this is South Boston here. Uh, the rest of this is all landfill. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of what we see nowadays is, is landfill, uh, including the, the back bay um, and uh, part of the back bay, actually the back bay is over here. Um, the, uh, the back bay was a, was a broad body of water at one time as well. Uh, Spectacle Island uh, is a, a pretty good distance from Boston. I believe it's about a mile and a half or so um, across the water. And historically, it had a lot of uses. Uh, it was uh, settled very early on. Um, it was used for, for timber, uh, for pasture, for farming, uh, navigation. They had a, they had a uh, lighthouse on it. Uh, it was a pest house in 1717. Uh, uh, many of the Harbor Islands were, were used uh, for um, uh, infirmaries or folks that were, were, uh, had contagious diseases. Um, there was a hotel hotel there uh, in 1847 and a horse rendering plant that opened in 1857 and I imagine the hotel probably did not outlast that <laughs> but they had uh, glue and oil production from that <clears throat> and starting in 1912 it was the Boston City dump and that built up the island substantially with about 60 feet of fill bottles, glass, ceramics, uh, whatever, whatever they, uh, they needed to uh, dispose of up until around the 1940s. Uh, we had an excavation that was on the south side of the island. The north side is where the landfill was. Uh, the south side had much less um, uh, in the way of alteration to it. Uh, but you can see here it says toxic landfill, Spectacle Island. Um, now when we look at the, this waterway, uh, it, it seems that this has been an open waterway for, for a very long time, and it has been. It has been for, for thousands of years. Uh, however, when we look at the whole of human history in Massachusetts, uh, the, the, the earliest uh, human arrivals here were roughly around 12,000 years ago. 
Uh, when, they, when they came here 12,000 years ago, the ocean was actually about 30 miles, somewhere around 20 miles away or so. And uh, about 10,000 years ago, uh, the ocean was all the way out here. And what we had is Spectacle Island is well inland, and what we see that uh, Hull, for instance, um, or the other islands in Boston Harbor, uh, at one time they were ridges and, and hills uh, that were well inland from where the ocean was. And uh, this is more or less what it probably would have looked like around that time. There would have been rivers. Uh, there's the Neponset River, the Charles River uh, that come through Boston. They would have uh, had their confluence somewhere east of Boston. Uh, there's several other rivers as well, the Mystic River and some smaller rivers. Uh, most likely these rivers would have been affected by the tides so that at high tide it would have looked like this and at low tide it would have looked like this. Uh, but it was a, a fairly nice place for, for folks to live. There was a, a lot of uh, good hunting grounds, uh, places to gather foods of different kinds. And what I want to do right now is just pan through about 7,000 years to show the difference of sea level rise over that time. Uh, these are scanned graphics, so they're a little bit grainy, but uh, they give a, uh, an idea. Um, the, the yellow here is, is uh, what was land, um, land at me, mean uh, low water. So in other words, uh, at uh, low tide, uh, this is all land that would have been exposed. Uh, this is roughly uh, about 15 miles from Boston on the, uh, on the outer coast. And then uh, we can, now imagine uh, this entire area being filled at the current rate of development as we pan through these. It'd be pretty alarming uh, to think about. Uh, there'd be whole towns underwater. Um, it would have been, uh, uh, a, a pretty devastating event. Um, sea level rise is something that's in the news. Um, it was in the news thousands of years ago. Uh, but the ramifications were quite different for ancient native peoples that were here uh, because they, they didn't uh, have, they weren't too fixed on the landscape. They could move their settlements, they could um, travel to new places by, um, by canoe, and I'm going to back this up a little bit. Uh, what we see is, uh, is there's a, a gradual um, period from about 10,000 years ago right up to around 6,000 years ago where the sea level rise was a little more gradual as it, as it came inward. Now what we don't see are the river valleys. Uh, that they don't show in these graphics. Uh, but there would have been ru rivers running through here, the Charles River and the Neponset. Uh, but around about 6,000 years ago, uh, there was, uh, it reached a point where the sea level rise was substantial enough that it started to flood Back Bay, for instance, at high tide. And uh, what we don't see is, is what the high tide limits are. Uh, this is at low tide. Uh, at high tide, there was substantially more water, and that created uh, these new environments with, where there was um, a big difference between high tide and low tide, and uh, that, would, that created a lot of opportunities for Native Americans that were around at that time. Uh, by about 4,000 years ago, the sea levels were a lot closer to where they are now. And, uh, and this is a, a prime time for some of the uh, most important archeological sites right here in Boston. In Back Bay, for instance, uh, one of the sites that I'll, I'll, I'll mention briefly is there were fish weirs. Fish weirs were fences, of sticks that were set in the mud flats. Um, they had a, a lathe work of, of smaller twigs between the, the upright posts. And, uh, and, and what those uh, fence lines did was uh, they allowed at high tide fish to swim beyond these fences. And at low tide, uh, the fish would be left, left on the mud flats. Now this is Spectacle Island roughly about 3,000 years ago. Um, what we have is we have uh, two islands, actually. It's not one island, and, uh, and they would have been hills earlier on. Um, 
around 6,000 years ago. By 1,400 years ago, um, they don't look dramatically different from what we saw 3,000 years ago. Our shell midden is right down here that I'll be talking about. This is a map from September 21st, 1703. It's the earliest map I have of Spectacle Island. Uh, just to show you what, what it looked like 1,400 years ago versus 1703, um, it's pretty similar in terms of its configuration. I turned the map sideways to, to line it up. Uh, but what we have is uh, we have a, a bar of land right here in the middle uh, that connects. And uh, this would have made it an excellent location for putting fish weirs in the water, uh, or for that matter, just coming in by canoe, uh, landing in this area, uh, having other types of fish traps or, or using nets. Uh, and also it meant that there were mud flats here uh, where there would have been abundant shellfish. Uh, now, one of the places I mentioned is, is the uh, Boston Fit Back Bay Fish Weir. And these wood stakes here uh, are from, they're the remains in, uh, preserved in clay in uh, Back Bay, Boston, of, uh, of stakes that are between 3,700 years old and 5,300 years old. Uh, when they started digging the tunnels for, for the subway, in the early 1900s, they started uncovering uh, huge expanses of these wood stakes. And uh, that was a big surprise. It was written about by early investigators in the early 1900s. Uh, they recognized that these were built by people. They're not a natural, it's not natural trees. These were stakes that were sharpened on the ends and driven into the mud. Uh, and it was more than a mile of these. At the time, it was thought that this was one massive fish weir, a huge fish trap. Of a, of a scale that was, you know, that no one would have thought possible. Uh, from more recent work, there was more work. Uh, these, this particular photograph is from the 1940s when they built the old John Hancock building. They uncovered a lot more fish weirs. And these, these are down about 30 feet. They're quite, they're buried quite deep. Um, about 20 feet is landfill and about 10 feet is sedimentation and, and uh, clays that, that built up. Um, and then in the 1980s when 500 Boylston Street was built, uh, there was another archaeological project, and they uncovered uh, quite a few uh, of these fish lines of fish weir stakes. And what they determined was this was not one massive construction. It was actually um, level upon level of constructions on a smaller scale, uh, that they were uh, small fence lines of fish weirs. Again, at high tide, fish could swim beyond them. At low tide, uh, people could go around with baskets or, or uh, fish spears and get the fish, or if, or if it's mud flats, they could just pick them up off the mud. Uh, the other thing that we find archaeologically is uh, the use of ground stone tools like this celt here. A celt is a woodworking tool, much like a hatchet or what folks might call, call a tomahawk. Uh, it has a nice sharp edge that's made by, by grinding it with, with stones and sand. And as a result, it's able to, to chop wood quite efficiently. Um, ground stone technology comes into use roughly about 9,000 years ago. Uh, the tools were, were available um, or, or being used by Native Americans uh, for woodworking. And uh, certainly by, uh, by uh, 9,000, 8,000 years ago, they had adzes as well as celts. And, uh, and a little bit later, they came up with grooved axes around 8,000 years ago. Um, these are the kind of tools that would be necessary for making dugout canoes. And the dugout canoes uh, enabled Native Americans to take full advantage of the changes in sea level. Uh, if a place was separated by the ocean as the sea levels rose, they could get out to it in canoes. They were also able to travel up and down rivers uh, so they could reach a wide variety of places uh, that, that on foot would take them quite a bit longer. Now on Spectacle Island, we had evidence of thousands of years of, of use. Uh, the shell midden itself, we found uh, in, in a couple of locations, there was a small midden over here. Uh, there's this midden here that's the main one that I'll be talking about. A shell midden is, is just a pile of shells. Uh, it's not a natural pile, it's, it's a pile that was uh, uh, deliberate in terms of people eating the, the clams and leaving the shells behind. And when we look at that part of the island, 
uh, we can trace the changes in, again, on the shoreline. It, it helps us as archaeologists to determine uh, what these places were like back when people were living there. In the case of, uh, uh, of the shoreline uh, that exists um, uh, as of about 1992, that's this outer, outer line here. Um, in the early 1900s, it was further in. 345 years ago, it was almost uh, all the way back to where it was 1,400 years ago. Um, however, um, the, uh, the edge of the island um, would have been affected by wave action. So uh, it's possible that what we were uncovering is what was left, and a lot of it may have gotten washed out to sea. The excavation took place in the summer of 1992. There were some earlier investigations. And uh, there were some continuous excavations, especially where, where the, the shell midden was. In all, there were 100 one meter squares, uh, which are basically a, a, yard, a yard square in size. So um, 100 square yards or 100 square meters. And this is the overall configuration of the excavation that we had. Now, the reason for the excavation was that the island was being reshaped uh, for all the fill that was being brought out there from the big dig. And uh, so this was, uh, it was a, uh, um, an excavation to learn what we can about the site before it was destroyed. Uh, we actually had two separate shell middens. We have one that runs right along here and another one that's larger. Uh, right here, and they may have been connected at one time. What we see here is the ocean's out here, and it's dropping down um, at, a, at a fairly steep grade. Uh, so this may have been eroded away through tidal action. Uh, so there may have been a, a, a much larger shell midden at one time. Uh, so what we have is, is based on what we were able to excavate. Uh, we don't know how much has been lost, but we still were able to learn a lot uh, just from what, what is there. The soil, there's a lot of very dark soil, uh, but when you look at it closely, uh, there's lots of fragments of shell, and this is predominantly soft shell clam or steamers. Uh, it looks like uh, there's a lot of dirt in there, but in reality, if, if we took a, uh, a hose and sprayed this down and washed off the darker soil, uh, it would almost be entirely shell throughout this, this stretch here. Uh, so it was very dense, uh, very fragmented, but we had a lot of shells that were, that were uh, quite intact or um, minimally broken. One of the nice things about shell middens is they do very well to preserve bone. The, the soils in New England are very acidic. Uh, bone usually dissolves in the ground within a few hundred years. Uh, really large bones may last a little longer, uh, but in general, bone dissolves very quickly. So we don't get a good record archaeologically of what people were eating. What we do find is burn bone, bone that's been burned at a high temperature, that'll preserve. Uh, in the case of the shell midden, though, the shell neutralizes the acidity in the soil, uh, and also the shell itself protects things that are buried within it. As a result, we ended up with many thousands of bones uh, from different types of food products. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, examples of the shells. It's soft shell clam. In all, there, uh, there's uh, many thousands that were recovered and, uh, and probably hundreds of thousands of fragments. Uh, but in general, what we, what we have is enough shell that based on analysis, um, it was able to be determined that the shell that we have on site would represent about 5.9 metric tons of clam meat, not including the shell weight. Uh, so that sounds like a lot of, uh, sounds like a pretty big clam bake. Um, however, if, if you look at it over a period of time, um, say for instance, um, um, how much clam meat does that mean over, for one year, over a 600 year period, it ends up being about 10 kilograms or about 22 pounds of, of clam meat per year over a 600 year period. Uh, there's also uh, some oyster shell, mussel, quahog. Um, they were pretty fragmentary for the most part, but, uh, but mussel shell, for instance, may, may have been uh, somewhere on the order of uh, 
of uh, two kilograms of mussel shell per, per year over a 600 year period. Uh, we had a wide variety of stone tools. Um, these, these are a little hard to see because of the, the darkness here, but, um, uh, but I'll talk about a few of these. This is the oldest of the, the projectile points that we recovered. And uh, this is known as a Neville point. They're about 6,000 to 8,000 years old. Uh, they would have been used on a throwing spear with the atlatl. Um, it's made out of a Boston, Boston Basin rhyolite, which is a volcanic stone. Um, it's a wide, wide number of locations where one can find stone like this around Boston, but it's, it's not common everywhere. Uh, but back around 6,000 to 8,000 years ago, Spectacle Island would have been a hill a good distance from the ocean. Uh, it would have been closer to rivers, though, and perhaps brooks. Uh, so most likely, uh, the, the uh, uh, person that lost this at, at, at that time uh, would have been out hunting, for instance, um, you know, in, in the foothills of, uh, of the area. Uh, the, uh, uh, the projectile point style is one that's recognized as a, as a regional style. It's one, they, they find uh, uh, these types of projectile points from this time period throughout the Northeast, all the way down to Tennessee. Tool traditions are very helpful in dating uh, what we find. Uh, there's certain types of styles that were used for, for a thousand years or two thousand years, and then the styles changed. In this case, we have what's known as a Brewerton, um, and uh, this one was found at the below the shell midden. Uh, so this was earlier than the shell midden. Um, the, the, the last point that I showed, um, it wasn't even found near the shell midden. It was found in testing away from the shell midden. Uh, this one was below the shell midden. It's around 4,000 to 5,000 years old. It's a, uh, a projectile point style that's seen throughout New York State as well as the, as the Northeast. Uh, this is a uh, small stem point. It's, they tend to be fairly crude, often out of quartz. Um, these were commonly used 2,000 to 4,000 years ago, uh, sometimes uh, even more recently. And uh, this is an illustration of, of uh, those two styles. Again, they're, they're well-documented styles of, of uh, projectile points. Um, and uh, um, the uh, small stem point was found in the shell midden. This was found in the shell midden. It's a very finely made point. It's known, known as a meadow wood point. Uh, those are, were made for a short period of time, about 3,000 years ago, up until about 2,500 years ago. And uh, then we have uh, other types of, of uh, tools. Uh, this is uh, probably used as a knife, but it, more, more typically these are found during the middle woodland period. Uh, the woodland period is the last 3,000 years, up to about 500 years ago. Uh, it's, it's when Native Americans were using pottery. And, uh, and this, this is a, a style of uh, artifact that's common roughly 1,000 to 2,000 years ago. One of the, the uh, nice things about the preservation is we had a lot of bone preserved. We had bone tools as well. Uh, again, something we usually don't find apart from, from a shell midden. Uh, we had these, these uh, barbed uh, harpoons or, uh, or uh, projectile points. Um, a couple of them were made out of the lower leg bones of deer. One was actually made out of the uh, lower uh, leg bone of a dog. Uh, there, there were not native dogs here during the woodland period. There were other types of bone points, awls, uh, or uh, this may have been a projectile point, um, but the awls could be used for uh, uh, puncturing cloth or skin. And uh, we had some other tools. This was a, uh, a hollow uh, leg bone, probably bird. Uh, it's been sawn off on both ends to create what may be a bead. Uh, we also had a drilled piece of slate uh, that would have been ornamental. Uh, they used uh, usually quartz drills. They used stone drills to, to drill the holes most often. And uh, this gives a, a variety. Uh, this projectile point over here, these other ones I've, I've already shown, but this one is uh, about 500 to 1,000 years old. That's the most recent style that we find. It was used right up to the colonial period. Uh, besides the bone tools, we also have this, which is a, uh, it's a, groove, a grooved stone, and uh, uh, they're known as plummets. Uh, they could have a line tied to them, and uh, the line could be dropped down, whether as a, uh, a sinker for a net or, or for fishing lines. 
And, and there was also uh, quite a few pieces of pottery. Uh, we had over 300 fragments of pottery, very small pieces for the most part. Most of them were recovered through uh, a process known as flotation where we take a bag of soil and we, we basically put it through uh, a water sieve and percolate, uh, uh, percolate air through it to help dissolve the, uh, the soil and clean off uh, any, uh, any artifacts or bones or, uh, or uh, burned seeds that may be there. And this is uh, uh, a pot that was found many years ago. Uh, we usually don't find these archaeologically. They're just pretty rare to, to actually find something this intact. Um, but what we were getting was small pieces. This is a rim fragment, for instance, uh, that would have come from the top of a pot. Uh, we didn't have very good preservation of, of pottery at the site. Uh, but, uh, but there are examples of, of whole pots that have been found. And uh, another uh, thing that we find is, uh, is what's called features. Features are uh, usually uh, some evidence of an activity that's been preserved. Uh, sometimes it can be a fire pit. Uh, it can be a hole that filled in. It was, uh, uh, they might, uh, Native Americans may have excavated a pit to throw uh, refuse and, and uh, trash in it. Uh, in other cases, it may be a hole that was excavated to put a post in the ground. Uh, so it may be a, the, the site of, a, a, of a, uh, a hut location, a Wee-Too as they were called. Uh, but we had a variety of features that were found within the shell midden, and, and many of them had well-preserved bones. Of the bones of 6,500 plus bones, uh, there were at least 20 species of mammals. Uh, there were uh, quite a few of fishes and birds. And uh, reptiles, we had uh, four box turtle fragments. Among the, the mammals, the most common are white-tailed deer, uh, which makes sense. Uh, they were most likely brought to the island rather than, than hunted on the island. Um, and, and the uh, age range is between one and three years old for the, for the deer. That, that can be determined from the, the long bones. Uh, but, so uh, those that were brought there were, may have been brought for, for meat, but they could have been brought with hides, antler, bone, uh, for, for uh, making bone tools, for instance, or using the antlers, and for suet. Bones of dogs were also represented. Um, dogs were occasionally eaten, especially in a time of need. A raccoon, beaver, and a harbor seal uh, were also represented. Birds included uh, Canada goose, brant goose, uh, ducks, uh, seabirds, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the scotter, the double-crested cormorant, and gull. Uh, there were two turkey bones, a uh, possible crow. Uh, here's, here's examples of some of, some of, the, uh, of the bird bones here. Uh, so bay duck, uh, scotter, black duck, and brant. Uh, by, by far, uh, fish were, were very common compared to bird remains. Uh, of uh, over 1,200 fish bones, we were able to identify nearly 900. These are otoliths, those are ear bones. And otoliths uh, preserve a wonderful history. Uh, if one were to grind these down and put them on a, a slide and examine them under a microscope, uh, they can tell how old the cod is because there's annual year rings here, just like tree rings, uh, but they can also determine what season the cod was caught. Uh, we, were not, we were not able to do that with, these, with the otoliths that we recovered, but I believe we had over 50 otoliths. Uh, there were a lot of vertebra of cod. Uh, these are uh, bony plates from sturgeon. Uh, so 97% 90, of the identified bone was, was cod, followed by, by flounder, uh, wrasse, sturgeon, alewife, and bluefish. And there were also plant remains. Um, uh, the, this uh, collection here are burned hickory nutshells. Uh, nutshells tend to preserve quite well when they're burned. Any, any plant remains that were not burned, uh, they were considered modern because they don't preserve very long um, and they're often brought in by burrowing animals. Uh, so what we were looking for was, was burned seed remains and we had uh, rubus, which is blackberry raspberry. Uh, we had uh, quinopod, which is related to quinoa. Uh, and uh, several grass species, which might have just been incidental. 
Uh, we had a number of distribution maps. I, I'm not going to show a whole bunch of distribution maps, uh, but I thought I would just give an idea of, of some of the analysis that we did. For instance, here we're looking at the distribution of, of shell with respect to where the cod is. So these circles represent concentrations of cod bones. And then when we look at the different types of bones or where the artifacts are being found, it gives us some sense of, of uh, activities across the, the midden and possibly being able to, to date certain areas a little, a little bit more uh, in more detail. And then uh, this is um, a, a relative map. It doesn't have any, any scale here to understand this with. But what it shows is from the deepest level of the shell midden, um, in this case the south midden, uh, one can see that it, how it increases over, over time as we go upward through the upper levels. Uh, so the shell midden starts out as a very thin layer of, of shells initially uh, that's pretty well trampled, but over time, um, especially through great, greater use, uh, the shell develops, uh, it, it becomes thicker and thicker. And this is an artist's, uh, artist's conception of what it might have looked like out on Spectacle Island uh, with folks, folks uh, fishing out in the water, um, uh, digging clams along the shore, um, having the campfire for cooking uh, and processing. A, a big part of what may have been taking place is the processing of foods. A lot of the clams may not have been eaten on the spot. They may have been dried or, uh, um, uh, or prepared um, for bringing elsewhere. Uh, the same thing with the fish. Uh, there may have been some hunting taking place. Uh, there were dogs around. And uh, in terms of the, the who, what, where, and when, uh, we know that they're, they're Algonquian-speaking people. Historically, this was an area that, where the Massachusetts lived. Uh, most likely, they, were, they came from the Neponset River drainage, uh, which is the closest drainage. The Charles River is, would be closer to the north end of the island. And uh, most of the, the radiocarbon dates that we have, despite the wide range of projectile points, the radiocarbon dates were primarily from about 500 AD up to 5, uh, 1590 AD, uh, so just before colonization. Uh, the midden spread slowly from south to north over the years, and, uh, and based on the seasonal evidence, uh, certain types of plants and animals that may be available only at certain seasons, it would appear that it was used mostly in the autumn and the spring, and primarily in the autumn. Uh, so that would have been the, the favored time for, for going out to the Harbor Islands. And it is a, a nice time right now to be out on the Harbor Islands. Um, summer is nice as well. Um, in terms of uh, the reports that came out of this, uh, we did have a middle school report, popular report, uh, that was produced uh, from this excavation as part of the Central Artery Project. And uh, more recently, uh, the site is included in a, a classroom guide for fifth through eighth grades. And uh, so it's available to the public and it can be downloaded directly from, from the website of the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And uh, this can also be downloaded. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, anyone here has a, has a copy of it, but it is, this came out about, uh, about 15 years ago uh, when they had an, um, a uh, exhibition at the uh, at the Mass Archives building, uh, but it's a wonderful um, it's a wonderful uh, uh, book that talks about the different sites that were ex excavated archaeologically for the Big Dig, including the Spectacle Island site. And uh, what I wanted to do with the next few slides is talk about a few of the sites that I was involved in. There's some sites I was not involved in. I won't be talking about them, but uh, uh, but briefly I'll, I'll mention some of the. Uh, sites in the north end of Boston that we excavated as part of the, dig, the Big Dig project. Okay, the central artery, for those of us who remember it. And the, the question is, how do we fix the traffic problem in Boston? Well, we, we can't fix it, um, but we can put it underground. And that's what the Big Dig did. Um, so as part of the Big Dig, there was uh, a very large area that was being excavated, and it was considered what could be excavated that's important archaeologically that hasn't already been dug up. So there's a lot of research done to figure out what hadn't already been dug up and uh, where we might find 
neighborhoods that are well preserved, whether it's uh, ancient Native American sites or co colonial sites. And uh, we had several sites that were located uh, that were so well preserved that we had excavations there, and uh, pretty, pretty large scale excavations. Um, they're very complex sites. When you look at these, it's a, it, there's foundations all over the place, there's, there's pits, there's um, uh, privies or outhouses. Um, there's a number of things that are, that are uncovered, and one has to, uh, as an archeologist, we have to understand the whole history of this site from when it was first settled and, 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 and each addition of foundations, of pits, whatever is there. And in this case, we're looking at backyards uh, and one of the backyards is, is a, a fellow by the name of John Carnes. John Carnes was a, a pewter smith. Uh, he had uh, uh, quite a few, uh, he, had, he was married three times. His second wife had a lot of, lot of children uh, from his second wife. Um, but uh, as a pewter smith, he was well to do. Uh, he died in 1760, and at that time he had nearly um, 600 pounds of pewter molds. Uh, so he was uh, well-to-do. He was famous as a, as a uh, pewter uh, craftsman at that time. Another thing that he did was, uh, was uh, brass work, and this may be, uh, this is a pineapple or, or some type of decorative element. Um, uh, he may have uh, made castings of these. Um, some of these other items, it's not clear if he made them or not. This is a, uh, a sconce, so an arm would come off that and hold a candle. Uh, so that would be affixed to a wall. Uh, there were a number of different types of tools that were found. Uh, and hardware. Um, we always find a lot of pottery. That's, if you see, uh, you've probably seen it in some of the other archaeological presentations. Pottery is one of the most common uh, things that we find, and uh, colonial era wine bottle fragments. Uh, what we also found were, besides the wine bottle fragments, we found uh, two bottle seals that would have come from a wine bottle that had his full name on it, John Carnes, and uh, they're both different styles as well. And he may well have produced the, uh, the mold work uh, for producing these seals. Uh, there was a short-lived uh, glass factory in Boston in the mid-1700s, mid, uh, so it's even possible that, that the bottles could have been blown in, in the Boston area. Uh, we had this casting here as well out of lead. Um, uh, we did not find this, by the way, uh, but that is the, the one example of a, uh, of a mug made by John Carnes. There's only two specimens of his work that, have, that are identified as, as being from John Carnes. This is in the Winter Term Museum, and this one here is, uh, is uh, from a, uh, a pewter plate. Uh, it says Carnes and Boston on it. A close up of the uh, wine bottle seals. You might notice this one's iridescent. Uh, that's actually a deterioration of the glass rather than how it was made. Uh, another site that was very important, it's right next door uh, to John Carnes. It's a cross street back lot site. Uh, and it's, uh, the, the highlight there is, is this uh, big rectangular area. It's double brick lined. Uh, these are bricks that were probably uh, made in a local kiln in the 1650s. So they're very early. Uh, uh, bricks, whether from Charlestown or Boston, they're locally produced, um, and uh, and it went down six feet in the ground. It's ten feet long, six feet wide. It's a it was a large outhouse. Most colonial outhouses are uh, less than a third of the size of what we have here. Uh, so this is a very large out, outhouse. And as it, it turned out, we we learned um, uh, quite a bit about about uh, uh, Catherine Nanny Naylor. Um, she married. Uh, she married in 1650 to Robert Nanny. Uh, Robert Nanny. Uh, he was a well-to-do merchant, and uh, they had eight children. Uh, he died in 1663, and at that time, uh, she shortly afterwards, she married Edward Naylor, and they had two daughters. Uh, but in 1671, she sued for divorce uh, because there was a lot of abuse going on, and it's well documented in the court records. Um, and uh, besides the abuse, there was infidelity on her husband's part uh, with the servants, and uh, one of which uh, it was uh, claimed uh, tried to poison um, Catherine. Uh, so it was um, a pretty um, detailed account that's been recorded, and, uh, and the divorce was granted. Uh, but one of the things that we find is she continued to live 
at the location uh, until her death in 17, six, uh, 1716. She was 85 years old at the time. Um, all of her children, though, only two lived to be adults. And uh, of them, uh, neither of them uh, uh, had children. They, they died as young adults, in fact. Uh, so it's very tragic. Um, but what we have is, uh, this is um, uh, our excavated site. We have, again, we have uh, different types of privies. We have footers. We have all kinds of foundations. And again, there's, there's a, a long, there's a, there's a way to, to separate out each of these events, when they date from. Uh, but what we have over here is the, where the outhouse is. And the outhouse was just, just full of information. Um, it's, um, uh, uh, it gives us a lot of information on the health of Boston at that time. Um, here we have Ellen Berklin. She's going through water screening. Um, she's the archaeologist from DCR. Uh, and we had uh, on the order of a quarter of a million seeds preserved. Uh, we have uh, just, um, just the uh, plum and cherry pits alone. I did a calculation that we had somewhere around 160,000 plum and cherry pits. Uh, there's also, uh, you might recognize peach, um, then the, lots of grape, lots of tiny seeds. We had to uh, do flotation uh, to recover the tiny seeds, but uh, many of them still, still float. Um, and these are, these are not recent. They were under a layer of clay. We had um, wood was well preserved, leather preserved. Uh, we had the, the usual ceramics, um, uh, the, but reconstructable ceramics. We were able to put together a whole jar. And this jar, this was a, a good foot high or so, uh, would have been made in Charlestown. Um, and we had all these round stains in the bottom. And what I think it was is it probably stored cherries. And it may be that the, that the, the cherries went bad or something, but they, they threw that into the, into the outhouse at some point uh, when the jar broke. Uh, we had a Bellarmine or Bartman jug, which has these nice little grotesque faces on them. Um, imported tiles uh, that uh, sometimes are Dutch, sometimes they're Mediterranean or, or English. Um, and then we had a lot of sewing related items. Uh, we have a, uh, right here we have a thimble, we have a pin cushion, uh, or this is a miniature bucket. It basically would have held cloth for, as a pin cushion and a, lan a, a lantern spoon. Um, here we have some of the other sewing related items. This is uh, made out of uh, bone. It's a uh, turned bone, it's, it's hollow inside, and it actually has a, a, threaded, a threaded end to it. So it would have had a threaded cap or a screw cap to it, uh, which is quite early to see something like that. Uh, tiny seed beads. Uh, these are actually held together with string that's still there from the 1600s. Um, pins, uh, we, a lot of silk ribbons. Uh, silk, only well-to-do people could wear silk, uh, and in this case, uh, we, the silk was very well preserved. Um, numerous ribbons. We also had uh, uh, quite a few shoes, quite a few children's shoes. Uh, we were able to preserve them and reconstruct them. Uh, this is a, a man's shoe here. Uh, the style is unique to, to Boston. It's, it's taking um, uh, the uh, uh, fellow that examined the shoes uh, found that, that it's, uh, it's taking a common style but adapting it in some new ways that hadn't been seen before. And, uh, and this item here is the country's oldest bowling ball. <laughs> it's a, a lawn bowling ball, or I've heard it uh, called a French lawn bowling ball. It would have had a weighted plug in it. Uh, it was often a gambling game. Uh, this is made out of oak. It's very solid and, and uh, was beautifully preserved. Um, but unfortunately, and it, it was so well preserved, we couldn't get the um, the preservatives into it to keep it from cracking, so that it ended up getting a little bit, um, uh, you know, getting some cracks that, that formed. Uh, now we also had uh, this nice pig skull. The bone was beautiful. Uh, the bone was like a green bone practically. It was uh, very fresh looking, but um, I, I wanted to include this uh, pig skull because um, the lower levels of, of the outhouse, um, uh, we had an entire pig. It was not a butchered pig. It was an articulated pig that was in the outhouse. Uh, the entire skeleton for it. And uh, uh, my impression of an outhouse is they're, they're pretty bad to start with, but to imagine a whole pig in there, uh, I don't know how people got by at that time. Um, and uh, we had all kinds of beetle remains as well. There are 46 species of beetles. They, some of them only eat peas, some of them eat vegetables, and uh, there's all kinds of uh, different types of contaminating beetles that can be nuisances. And at the level with the pig, we had all different types of uh, carrion-eating beetles. Uh, so we know for sure that the, the, the pig was either um, fell in there by accident or was thrown in there, I don't know, but, uh, uh, but they probably made the outhouse unusable for some time. 
And uh, then we have the Mill Pond site. I'm, I have a little, a few more minutes here, uh, but uh, the Mill Pond site I'll, I'll go over briefly. Um, it, it was a, a site that, uh, let me show the map here because that's helpful. This is the Mill Pond. So here we have the north end um, right over here and uh, between the north end and, and, uh, and, and this part of Boston, um, we have this uh, um, uh, tidal area that was, uh, they built a dam across it and uh, early on they had mills on it. Um, this was filled in uh, around 1807 to between 1807 and 1814. Uh, but before that, there were a lot of docks and wharves there. And uh, we had, a, uh, again, a complex history of, uh, of wood timbers. And we, we cut off samples of these to do dendrochronology to check the uh, tree rings and figure out exactly when these constructions were built. But for the most part, they were built from the, between the very early 1700s, uh, some of them maybe even late 1600s, right up through um, through the uh, late 1700s, uh, different types of r repairs. Um, now the area was filled in and it became the uh, Bullfinch Triangle area here. Uh, so here's the mill pond filled in on an 1814 map. Uh, here's uh, Beacon Hill being leveled uh, to fill it in. And here's uh, folks digging it up again. And among things that we, we found there, there were a lot of incidentals uh, that were uh, either discarded. Uh, here we have broken shovels. Shovels at that time were wood, and these are just the metal edges to them. Uh, there were items that were lost by accident, like this. Uh, uh, this is a uh, eight real uh, silver coin, Spanish mill dollar from the 1790s. Uh, to make change, they would cut it into pieces, and this would be a four bit here. Um, we also have a silver needle here of a fairly large size uh, that was used for lacing. Uh, and a piece of uh, African style pottery, which um, analysis of it uh, determined that this, the clay may actually, this pot may have actually been made in the Caribbean, uh, most likely Haiti. And in the early 1800s when this was filled, um, there were a lot of uh, Haitian uh, folks that um, they had gotten their freedom on Haiti and they started going elsewhere. So it's quite possible that folks from Haiti were arriving in Boston at that time over 200 years ago and bringing some of their, their uh, pottery with them. Uh, and then the last site I'll talk about is uh, the South Boston Glass Factory. Uh, this was uh, begun in 1811. It went through, uh, it lasted about 20 years. Then it went through a period of uncertainty and short-lived ventures. And then uh, around about 1843, uh, to 1858, um, it was the, uh, the American Glass uh, Manufactory. Let me just check my uh, name here. <laughs> yeah, the American Glass Company from 1843 on. Um, but uh, South Boston Flint Glass Works, uh, they made some really nice material there. This was not a, a bottle producing uh, place. They, they did make these fine colored uh, scent bottles, which are usually attributed to sandwich, uh, but we know from the various uh, stages of production uh, that we found at the site that they were being made on site. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this was a rescue operation here. Uh, we knew the site was there, but because it was a uh, hazmat site, um, it was determined not to do archaeology there. But then uh, uh, we received a phone call that they found a couple of uh, cisterns there that looked really interesting, and, uh, and they wanted to get them tested for dangerous materials. Uh, so meanwhile, uh, we showed up on site and we investigated. One, one didn't have anything of interest, but the other one uh, was, was a, uh, a wood barrel. It was uh, three feet wide. It turned out to be a privy, and it was just loaded with all kinds of fancy glassware that was being made at the factory. Uh, so we had a rescue excavation there. Uh, this is part of uh, uh, the, uh, the furnace for one of the glass factories, and uh, that's me over there. They're uncovering um, the remains of the glass factory. Uh, there was a deal with the central artery that the hazardous material at this site would be carted away uh, somewhere to the Midwest to a special landfill. Well, the, the hazardous site was the glass factory uh, because, uh, uh, as it turned out, the, the barrel had high levels of lead, arsenic, and mercury. And uh, lead, leaded glass is what, you know, flint glass is made with lead. It's clear crystal glass. Uh, so any factory that makes leaded glass or makes crystal um, is, is going to have high levels of lead around. Uh, arsenic, again, uh, some of these were used as coloring agents, trace amounts. 
uh, I believe the arsenic uh, uh, produced the uh, milk glass, and uh, mercury again for, I, I believe, silvering, and it may have uh, also been used in getting a, the uh, red color of some of the ruby uh, red glass that was there. Uh, but we had a lot of pressed glass there, a lot of fancy tablewares. Uh, we had pharmaceutical glass, we had uh, uh, like test tubes. Um, um, there was a, a number of uh, types of uh, scientific ware that were being produced there, ground glass. Um, not, not a normal uh, glass factory in the sense of this was a little more specialized, a little more uh, uh, catering to the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, better taste uh, tableware as well as uh, the scientific community in Boston. And, uh, and all of these uh, hazardous materials uh, made some pretty good looking glass. <laughs> And you can read about these sites and other sites that I didn't talk about uh, in this book. Again, it's downloadable online, and I believe that's it. Uh, I forget the date, but you left us on Spectacle Island with like a little sand spit that connected the two. Yes. Um, eventually, though, how long does it take or, for that to fill in? Because, uh, or, or did the landfill fill it in? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I suspect the landfill played a big part oh, okay. in that uh, because the whole North Island had about 60 feet of fill added to it. And it was remarkable if, 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 if you went by in a boat at, back when it was there, the ocean had cut away a cliff and it just, it just gleamed like crystal in the, in the sun because of all the glass and metal and whatever else was there. Uh, it, was, it was quite remarkable. And on the beaches, there was all kinds of glass and a lot of marbles. A lot of interesting stuff in, uh, that had washed out from the landfill. So I suspect that, that that narrow area did get filled in at that time. I don't know if there were any earlier, um, any earlier efforts to try to, to fill in or build it up at, at all or not. Thank you. Hi. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, first, just curious how you know which animals' bones come from. Like, does mm -hmm. that involve DNA back in the night or you can just tell from the shapes of the bones and then the second question was um, where the artifacts from the outhouse site um, like where are they now mm -hmm. yes both good questions uh, the, uh, the, the the first uh, you, you, you guessed uh, the, the shape of the bones is, is what really tells us um, DNA testing would, would also make that determination, uh, but back when we, we did this work, there, there wasn't a whole lot of DNA testing going on, but also it's fairly expensive. But um, uh, in terms of um, the, the bones, um, a lot of the work that was done on them, it was with the uh, Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. Uh, one of the, the specialists, uh, what she would do is, is, is uh, uh, she could narrow down the, the identification of the bones, but then she would compare them with actual uh, skeletons and match the exact fragment of that bone with the skeleton. And, uh, and uh, that can be done with, with, with bird as well as fish and mammal. Um, and I've, I've had that training as well. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to, to actually match those bones. But if you have a really small fragment, it can be difficult. And some fragments, just, it just can't be done. They can be classified uh, to a certain level, but one can't really make that determination. It's more the, like the articular ends of the bones or, or, or if, if one has teeth or skulls, skull pieces or um, you know, digits like the, uh, the foot bones, for instance. Um, those are usually the, the best for identifying. Uh, and in terms of where the collections are stored, uh, they're all stored at the Massachusetts Archives building. Uh, they have a, a, a large laboratory in the, in the basement of, of the building um, uh, where the collections are. And uh, except for some of the glass factory, some of the glass factory um, is uh, actually stored in, our, in the storage room for my company, which uh, when they have room, we'll move those to the, uh, to the Massachusetts Historical Commission. They're, they're at capacity, so they, it's a lot of collections that, uh, that have been generated from the various projects. I was interested in, you were digging it for the, where the casting base happened in South Boston. And the red building in the background is where I live today. Yes. And we collected a lot of stuff, but I wondered if that pile, the refuse pile, went to Spectacle Island. That's, um, oh, uh, you mean in the, in the 1990s? Are you wondering if the refuse pile went there in the 1990s? Well, what they dug out yes. to... Oh, from the big dig. For the yes. casting basin. The soil that they took out of there 
did it go to Spectacle Island? Uh, if it was from, if it was part of the Big Dig project, I, I would say most likely, uh, because that was the, the plan was to, I think it was six million cubic yards of earth that they were moving from the Big Dig, and, uh, and that reshaped Spectacle Island. It's a nice park now, uh, and they capped the, 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 the landfill and you know, made it a, a much nicer place to visit. Uh, but most likely, I, I think that's probably where it went. Thank you. Just a quick question about the Spectacle Island dig. Again, sort of going back to the bones question. Can you tell from even the, shell, the shells themselves or the bones how the material was cooked? Were these uh, boiled mm -hmm. meals or were they put through fire? Uh, that, that is a, a really good question. Um, if we have burn marks on it, we usually can, and some of the bone did have burn marks. Uh, for instance, if, um, uh, if, if, you, if you roast a, uh, like a, say a leg of deer, for instance, uh, the articular ends are kind of bony, so they will burn first before the really meaty sections. So what you end up with is, is a, a bone that's burned on, on the ends, uh, but not in the middle. Uh, so that does give, give us an indicator. In most cases, though, we don't have clear evidence of, of the burning. What we might have is, is cut marks, which might show some level of butchering, for instance, of deer or dog or, or, um, uh, or bird, for, for that matter. Uh, fish usually wouldn't, you wouldn't usually find that kind of evidence on, on fish. In terms of the, the, uh, the, the shells, uh, we usually did not find evidence of them them being burnt, but we did have charcoal mixed with them a lot of times. So they, they could have been steamed, uh, perhaps mixed with, with uh, kelp and steamed over uh, hot rocks, for instance, and that would have opened them up. So that's a possibility, but, uh, uh, but we're not entirely sure. Some of them we know that they, they open them um, by busting the edge of the shell, because the shells were well enough preserved. You could actually see where the edges were, were hit and, and knocked off, and, and, then, uh, and then they would have used something sharp, perhaps a shell, like a muscle shell knife, and slip that in there to, to be, be able to cut it free. Well, I want to thank you very much again, Martin, for a pretty interesting okay. presentation. Well, thank you all. You see, Harry believed that women and men should be co-equals in all aspects of their lives and their partnership. It was Harry who suggested that we write a marriage protest. And this protest was read at our nuptials and published in every single newspaper across the United States of America. My favorite part read thus. 